thank you very much for um, coming on a Friday. Um, I think it's the first time we've had one of these lectures on a Friday, so thank you for coming uh, on a Friday to our Science and Populism series. This, for those of you um, who haven't been before, this is the second um, term. We started in Trinity, um, and the whole idea is in the current climate, where populism is attacking not only the political elite, but also, it seems, anybody with education is now being classed as an elite. And this is particularly having impacts on things like art, theatre, and the sciences. We thought it would be interesting uh, to run a series where we took an array of different speakers uh, from different aspects of science, and particularly communicating science, uh, and ask them to give their own personal uh, perspective and it's been a, a fantastic series where we have gone from uh, we've had members of Go Science, members of the Cabinet Office, we've gone through the academies, um, we've had um, science associations. Uh, last week you may, um, some of you may have been here and we had Imran Khan from the uh, Wellcome Trust talking about public engagement um, but we haven't yet had a science journalist so we are delighted that um, Clive has agreed to come uh, and give his particular take uh, on uh, communicating robust science, and he's going to talk a bit uh, about science journalism uh, then uh, and now. Um, Clive is actually uh, a, a member of us. He is a graduate um, of Oxford uh, University, having uh, taken a first-class degree in chemistry, um, and then um, going into uh, journalism, uh, where he has worked both uh, in the UK uh, and in um, America. Uh, he's worked for the Times, he's worked for the um, Times Higher Education Supplement, he's used for, uh, worked for BBC Radio as a science uh, correspondent, and he's been the science editor of the FT since um, 1991. So we are going to get a, a huge um, array of um, uh, sort of evidence and how it has changed. Um, he's also an honorary member of the British Science Association and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, and before I invite um, Clive up, I just wanted to read something um, which I think sort of sets uh, the scene um, of this series, but also particularly uh, of tonight. And I, it was a quote um, from Jim Nichols uh, called uh, The Death of Expertise. Um, and he wrote, uh, for many centuries before the Age of Enlightenment, religion and superstition were permitted to influence and dominate society. After a mere 300 years in which the uh, explanation of evidence has been recognized as the best driver of human affairs, there is now a movement to replace this principle. Access to Google fuels delusions that, the, um, that these sources endow citizens with a sufficiency of knowledge and wisdom to offer judgments which are at least as valid and probably more valid than those of experts. Uh, and I think uh, there's nobody better really to talk from a communication point of view uh, than Clive uh, on how we can communicate robust, robust science um, in today's climate. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for your very generous introduction. Um, I'm very keen for lots of interchange at the end. Um, I want to leave at least 20 minutes, maybe even, even longer, because there is so much to ask, to say, to challenge, to question about the way science is presented these days. And my background piece will probably touch on a small fraction of what concerns you. So please store up your, your questions. I was going to start um, with a couple of history lessons, a very brief one about me, which can now be even briefer because um, Sarah has already given you my um, life history. And then on to a, a slightly longer history of science journalism. But about me, I am not only an Oxford chemist, former Oxford chemist, but I'm also a product of Oxbridge chemistry because both my parents were chemists. My mother was a grad student here at Oxford at St. Anne's. My father was at Cambridge and they met in a chemistry lab <laughs> at, as postdocs at Harvard. So um, after doing um, chemistry here at Brasenose, I realized I hadn't inherited the parental talent for chemistry, but I loved writing, so 
um, I applied to the graduate training scheme for the now long defunct Thomson newspaper group. Um, and as Sarah said, I've been a science journalist for the whole of my working life. And as she also said, I've been science editor of the FT for almost 30 years. So although I'm not the longest serving member of the FT's staff, I'm certainly the person who's been doing the same journalistic job there for longer than anyone else, which certainly, which may say something about um, the special nature of science in journalism and the fact that people, um, the editors regard science journalists not as people they can move around as they do almost everyone else. Um, that's enough about me for the time being. Science journalism um, emerged as a well-defined speciality um, in newspapers in that heady period after the Second World War, when people thought that research had won the war for the Allies. Um, antibiotics and medicines, as well as techie things like radar and super weapons. Um, and it was expected, at least by some people, that science and research would provide a prosperous peace and would drive innovation in industry, transport, healthcare, and so on. In fact, one or two papers did have what were originally called scientific correspondents before the war. And I think the first appointment is generally recognized to have been J.G. Crowther at The Guardian in 1929. Most of the rest waited until the late 40s or the early 50s. In fact, my first predecessor, the original FT scientific correspondent, uh, Francis Simon, started in 1948. And unlike me, he was a distinguished scientist in his own right. In fact, he was a professor of thermodynamics in the physics department here, here at Oxford. And he was really more of a science commentator I would say, than a science journalist, certainly not a science reporter. However, those pioneering science reporters, interestingly, missed the two most important discoveries of the mid-20th century, the transistor and the structure of DNA. And although Bell Labs actually held a press conference in New York in June 1948 to announce the first transistor, the presentation was too long and too technical for the journalists present to realize its significance, that the age of electronics had begun. So I'm afraid the story, that story didn't make the front page of any story in America, let alone Britain. Um, Francis Crick and James Watson, as everyone knows, published their paper on the double helix structure of DNA on the 25th of April, um, 19... 1953, um, yet nothing appeared in a newspaper until three weeks later on the 15th of May when the News Chronicle's Richie Calder, who was a legendary science editor, he reported a talk about the discovery by Lawrence Bragg, who was head of the Cavendish lab where Crick and Watson were based. Um, sorry, it's rather a fuzzy picture. Um, that's the News Chronicle, and if you can't read it, it says at the top, why you are you, which is quite a nice tagline. Um, today, both Nature and Cambridge University's PR departments would have made sure no one missed the research development of such significance. Um, in the 1950s, the big themes of UK science journalism included aviation and atomic power, both in its destructive form for nuclear weapons and its peaceful form to generate electricity. There we have the FT's scientific correspondent in 1956. There was also a rather patriotic urge to trumpet British developments, such as the flying bedstead, which was a, an early, early forerunner of vertical takeoff aircraft, and Zeta, a nuclear fusion experiment at Harwell that promised electricity too cheap to meter. And as you know, fusion, nuclear fusion has been promising that ever since and still does today. Um, the great science story of the late 50s and particularly the 60s was, of course, the race into space. And then this is, this, and then to the moon. 
And now this moon landing souvenir issue of the standard had a carefully mocked up image, mocked up in advance because real pictures of the moon weren't yet available. And this dramatic front page doubled evening standard say, sales to 1.2 million. Of course, it would have been a, an expensive and embarrassing mistake if Apollo, 9, Apollo 11 had failed. But by the 1970s, the media's previous rather gung-ho, gee whiz view of science was becoming more negative. And this tr change was triggered, I think, more than anything by the emergence of environmental pollution as a serious concern. Journalists came to see nuclear power stations less as an energy panacea than as bombs waiting to go off, particularly after Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. And then the emergence of the ozone hole through CFCs over the Antarctic showed how human activities could harm the atmosphere. And scientists at about the same time started to warn that um, growing consumption of fossil fuels was likely to cause global warming through the greenhouse effect. And though, of course, climate change has been a very big issue ever since, I myself think that it's underplayed. And certainly last month, the latest IPCC report about the effects of 1.5 degree warming got rather, well, much too little space in the papers, I think. Um, at this time, back to the 70s, the increasing skepticism of the media affected coverage of the life sciences too. The most important disruptive technology of the 1970s, recombinant DNA, was presented, quite rightly, as a two-edged sword. Yes, genetic engineering promised huge advances in medicine, but when biologists themselves proposed a moratorium on genetic engineering research, in 1976, because of the possible risks, they unleashed a plague of stories about the mutant microbes that might arise. None of these horrors actually materialized, and nowadays I'd say the media portray the medical applications of genetic engineering in a generally positive light, though the possibilities of human gene editing have aroused new ethical concerns. And certainly the mistrust lives on when it comes to genetic manipulation of plant and fruit, food crops. Since the birth in 1978 of Louise Brown, the first test tube baby, human reproduction has been one of the most fruitful fields of science journalism. Development of techniques for genetic testing of test tube embryos, whether for gene disease propensity or desirable characteristics spawned endless test tube designer baby stories. Then journalistic imaginations ran riot after the revelation in 1997 that adult mammals could be cloned with Dolly the sheep, followed in 99, no, 98, by the derivation of human embryonic stem cells, which could divide indefinitely and potentially generate any tissue in the body. Horror stories about the evils of human cloning have vied for news space with speculation that stem cells would be able to cure every degenerative disease known to woman or man. But we science journalists have not neglected the really deep cosmic questions about the nature of the universe. And this wonderful front page from 1992 shows how good the independent was in its old and much lamented broadsheet form at presenting science. And this illustrates the almost 14 billion year history of the universe based around a story about NASA satellite observations, which showed faint, faint echoes from the formation of the first galaxies. The most important general point I want to make, though, is that in my long experience, science coverage has become better, more thorough, more accurate, more educational, and more entertaining. And I think it continues to get better. On the whole, 
This is not because science journalists like me have improved. The main reason is that scientists themselves have become steadily more communicative, more willing to answer questions in a cooperative and timely manner, and more proactive in offering relevant information to the media. Here we see the old dying, or maybe dead attitudes. You wouldn't get away with that now. People, grant givers, funding organizations insist even if you personally don't want to do it, that you um, try to communicate and involve the public in your work. And we can talk later about how successful that is. Um, this is another, this is an example of the new um, attitude. This is scientists uh, with their heads, um, on the back of their heads showing, talking to, um, journalists at the Science Media Centre in London. The Science Media Centre, or SMC, I think is a marvellous organisation. It was set up 15 years ago as an independent press office for science. Not everyone loves the SMC like I do, and I should disclose at this stage that for the first 10 years of its existence, I was a member of the SMC advisory board. With a staff of five or six specialists, press officers, the SMC can move quickly to put scientists' views whenever a science-related issue hits the headlines, both through quick reaction emails, and we'll see an example of that later in my talk if we have time, and also through briefings like this at its base at the Welcome Collection on Euston Road. The SMC also works behind the scenes to train scientists to communicate better with the public through the media. The SMC values its independence, so its funding comes from a large number of different companies and research organizations with a limit of 5% on contributions from any one source. However, I should add that um, the SMC certainly has critics who argue that it presents a homogenized, a very establishment-oriented view on, on controversial issues, which is fair enough. You can go to other places if you want an alternative view, and a responsible science journalist should. If it's environmental, they should go to Greenpeace, they should go to Friends of the Earth, um, so it is a, I think it's a very good voice of science. And I think it's, I'm sure not everyone would agree, but I think if you were to look for one thing which has been good for science journalism in the last 15 years, this would be it. And its success here in London has encouraged people in other countries to set up their own science media centers. And there is ones in existence in Germany, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan. And they gathered last month in London to discuss issues of common interest. I went to a, an evening debate on attempts by governments to muzzle scientists who were trying to talk to the um, media. A particularly shocking example was in Canada, I learned, um, Stephen Harper's um, conservative government, which came before Justin Trudeau, had an extraordinary chilling effect on the communication of um, Canadian science, much of which is world class, particularly on subjects like the Arctic, how the Arctic was faring with global warming. Um, it's probably even worse than what Trump is doing. Anyway, we can talk about that later as well. Um, as everyone knows, science journalism is entering or is in a more difficult period now because of the general internet-inspired ferment in the media. In the UK and Europe, unlike in the US, there have been very few actual closures of large newspapers. The papers are still here, but print media are sacrificing specialist science reporting as they try desperately to cut costs 
in response to rapidly falling circulation and advertising revenues. At the same time, television companies are becoming less willing to invest in serious science programs, David Attenborough notwithstanding. It's essential, therefore, um, that scientists don't react to this by retreating from the media in disappointment. They must build, build on what's already been achieved and make even more effort to communicate their, wor their work to the outside world. Surveys continue to show that people are still relying mainly on the traditional media to learn about science. This one comes from Pew Research in the US last year. I think they're the top organization in the world for um, measuring public attitudes to science. Um, it shows that 36% of, Ameri of Americans receive some science um, news every week, and 30% act sometimes seek out science stories, and they categorize 17% as active consumers of science news. And if you can read the figures below, um, most of these Americans, 54%, get their science news from general news outlets. Although depressingly, only 28% think that these news outlets get their science facts right most of the time. Another Pew survey this year looks at science in social media. Here, we see that 26% of social media users follow at least one science-oriented site, and 33% of social media users regard um, social media as an important source of science news. But Pew seemed responsible disappointed when I read the report that, it, um, that its analysis of 30 science-oriented pages on Facebook showed that only 29% of posts related to new research or discoveries rather than news you can use or ads or promotions. We've known for many years that um, the public trusts scientists, and according to this Ipsos Mori study here in the UK last year, trust in scientists has actually gone up by 20% since 1997, so that's encouraging. Though, as always, sadly, in these surveys, you find estate agents, politicians, and yes, journalists coming near the bottom of the trustworthiness league. It's interesting that journalists are ahead of professional footballers. That was a surprise, because <laughs> you'd have thought some of these footballers would be sort of superheroes to their fans, but you can't trust what they say, apparently. Um, so where then do sad stories come from? <laughs> Firstly, there are press releases and official announcements, and these pour in by email, of course, though a few still come by post, and they're so rare that I actually notice them, and I'm more likely to respond. On a typical day, I'll get 200 or more press releases and publicity materials like corporate magazines by email, it takes hours to go through everything. And of course, the vast majority are immediately deleted. But I rarely ask organizations to take me off their press release list, just, just in case. Um, I want to, let me see. I just want to go on to say something here about PRs, because it's relevant. Um, the growing imbalance between journalists and PRs. This is affecting the media worldwide. The figures here um, come from the US, 
but something similar it has happened in the UK. Um, almost five PR professionals for every reporter in America. It's quite a change over the last 15 years. Um, um, I'm, the prop may well be some PRs here in the audience, so I, I, I will say I do love you and I recognize the great work you do and it's an essential job that can make life much easier for journalists and improve reporting. But please be more discriminating and selective about the stories that you pitch. I'm going to go back to um, the categories. Of <coughs> Second source is personal contacts, and of course these can produce the best stories of all, those sought-after exclusives and scoops. Thirdly, there are visits to press conferences, it's scientific meetings, above all to labs and um, corporate laboratories. Um, these usually produce a worthwhile story, always produce good background material. I could do my job from the desk now using the phone and the internet, but I'd be missing out very, very seriously. And I also try to travel abroad when I can to get an, an international perspective because the FT prides itself on being a global newspaper. Fourthly, the academic journals. Original papers in nature and science and so on are the single most important source of news for science and medical journalists. The journals usually give us their most interesting papers a few days ahead of publication on an embargo basis to provide time to prepare stories. But embargoes of this sort are quite controversial and if anyone wants to talk about it later, we can. Lastly, and worst of all, is following up something that's appeared elsewhere, another paper or magazine, a wire service, radio or television. In other words, you've been scooped, you've missed a good story. So, non-journalists ask me very often, what, what attracts media attention? What makes a good story, a good science story? And unfortunately, it's extremely hard to define for outsiders or even for insiders. And you can list glibly attractive ingredients like sex intrigue, death and disease, bizarre events, genuine scientific breakthroughs. If someone doesn't want you to publish the story, that adds a frisson of excitement. Above all, though, I think a good story is unexpected. One test is, guess what, darling? Is the story interesting enough to tell your spouse or partner about after dinner or drink after work? Frequently, though, the challenge uppermost in the journalist's mind is not so much to get the scientific truth across to the reader or viewer as to sell the story to the news editor or whichever other internal gatekeeper the newspaper or magazine or TV program employs. The media always has a vast oversupply of potential stories. I mean, I could write a hundred interesting stories this week uh, if I had time. Even at slack periods like Christmas, New Year and the August silly season, um, is a vast overabundance of potentially interesting stories. And if your story isn't sensational enough com to compete with stories in other areas, politics, for example, or um, celebrities and some, some other media outlets, the editors will ignore it. Or even worse, if you've written it, delete it spike it, to use the old-fashioned journalist term, dating back to when every desk literally had a nasty metal spike and surplus copy was rammed onto it, finger injuries resulting. <laughs> um, so, as I was saying, journalists may exaggerate the story to sell it to the news editor, 
And then they feel they have to write it up to meet that exaggerated sales pitch. And it may be further exaggerated when a sub-editor writes the headline or changes the intro. So if, if I pick up what I think is a good story, I'll negotiate with the appropriate news desk. In our case, UK News, World News, Companies News, and so on, before I even think of writing it. Um, if it's really important, I may go straight to the new overall news editor who controls what appears on the front page of the newspaper or at the top of our FT.com website. And a similar process, of course, applies to features, the longer articles. Um, I agree, word count, outline of the piece, delivery time, um, deadlines, etc. And we can talk later about that if you're interested. The point is to avoid writing for the spike. Um, on the FT, most of the commission pieces do appear, although they may be cut substantially during the editing process. And the news stories, the writers, not usually consulted about the cutting or the editing. Um, there was, until very recently, a feeling on the FT and other papers that if your story wouldn't go on into the print paper, at least it would always find us a spot on ft.com, but now news editors are tightening up what goes online too in the interest of quality control. And the informal target this year on the FT was to have 10% fewer stories appearing online. Um, I just can't emphasize enough the extent to which the process by which some stories are picked up and run in the media while others never get started is so chancy and even capricious. Coverage depends on what else is around on that day, who is on duty. If I'm away on holiday, there are fewer science stories in the FT. Um, but before finishing, is it? yes, I'd like to run quickly through a recent example of scientists' willingness to talk promptly to the media about a politically explosive science-related story where very little information was publicly available. And I'm grateful to the Science Media Center for this um, sequence um, about the Novichok incidents in, incident in Salisbury. Um, I was very impressed by the way um, scientists were happy to talk, even when there was very little, very, very little um, information. Um, at the beginning, it wasn't even clear um, whether it was radiation or chemical poisoning. Um, we still, people were, were prepared to offer guidance. This is reactions put um, out by the Science Media Center. Um, it's, I thought, I think they, they, these, this was very useful. Um, they were already saying likely to be a chemical source rather than um, radiation. Um, here are some others I can, um, they were there was compassion in this, I think, as well as um, science. They were talking about how people could be treated. This Alistair Hay at Leeds was marvelous in being willing both to speculate, but to, to speculate in, in an informed way. He's a, he was an absolute model, as, as you can see. Um, Here we have more. There were um, it was people were st at this stage. This is the early stage. They were reluctant to speculate. Quite rightly so. Um, the um, There was one, I'm trying to find out, Alistair Hay did, 
make um, one mistake, which, um, and then it, when, it, when we knew it was a nerve agent, they produced a lot of really excellent advice, which was reproduced in, in news stories. Um, this is where Alistair, so here Alistair Hay is quoted in the Daily Mail, and he suggested that the risk to the public was absolutely trivial. Um, if it was going to be a problem to other people, it would have manifested itself by now. Unfortunately, that turned out not to be true um, because of the unfortunate woman who was poisoned by the bottle of Novichok found later. Um, but it was still a reasonable thing, to, reasonable thing to say, and people shouldn't be afraid of making statements based on, on the evidence. Um, they were asking for patience. Public shouldn't panic. These are, here are some of the experts. Now, what do we notice about all the experts so far? Yes, <laughs> they're all men, <laughs> which they are all white. Um, and that brings me to an issue that very few people in the media thought about when I started in journalism, but is now very important, which is diversity. And particularly gender diversity, though as, as you said, racial diversity is important as well. Um, this um, very, very good science journalist, Ed Yong, who's one of the best in the world, I think, managed to raise the proportion of female sources in his stories, in his science stories, um, from 25% to 50%, just by making a sustained effort to contact women scientists. And he was so dedicated, he didn't just do it, but he had a spreadsheet so that he counted the number in every, every story. Um, I'm trying to, but I don't think I've done quite as well yet as Ed. And I wanted to close, too, by mentioning two initiatives that the FT has introduced um, this year. Um, first of all, um, we had something called Janet Bot for photos. Um, this was to an initiative to increase the number of um, photos of women on our homepage of ft.com. Um, and it has succeeded, I think, quite well. Um, that was introduced earlier in the year, and apparently there's been a 14%, 14 14 percentage point increase in the proportion of women on the top half of the home page because people are really trying. And 37% of pictures now feature a woman compared with 23% before the experiment started earlier this year. Um, following Janet Bott, we had He Said, She Said, which is a new um, algorithm, which again, this analyzes all copy um, automatically um, and on the basis of people's first names and whether they're described as he, her, his, she, etc. cetera, um, whether they're male or female. It can't be completely accurate. There are Robins and there are foreign names, which it doesn't always get right. Um, it hasn't yet produced any results because it's too early to, to say. But on average, only 21% of um, sources quoted in stories by name are women, although this varies a lot between um, different editorial desks on the paper. Um, highest proportion was on, is in the work and careers section, where we've got 34% women. Now, you could say um, that the fact that there is a higher proportion of women in the pictures than there is 
in uh, the sources quoted in the words in the copy shows that people are trying to take a superficial attitude. But I, I think this is a, an initiative that's really shaken up um, the consciousness of the editorial staff, including me. Um, looking at my watch, I'm going to stop now because I'd like to leave at least 15 minutes, which is what we have, for questions and answers. Thank you very much. That was, yeah. Yes, that was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And I'm so glad you um, are so positive about the Science Media Center. Um, we had Fiona Fox last term come and talk to us. Um, and one of the things I, I thought of when you were, I was going to ask this question, because you obviously come from the FT, but then you mentioned the Daily Mail. Um, mm. is, is there a, a true sort of representation of all press outlets that are connected to the SMC, or, or does it tend to be biased towards certain papers or certain outlets? I would say that the, the Mail is the most frequent attender of all at their, um, at their briefings because the Mail still has, unlike most others, quite a distinction between the Daily Mail newspaper and the um, Mail website. It has different staff, etc. And the latter has a voracious appetite for science and medical stories, and so does the newspaper. So you may even um, have two different people from the mail there. I mean, only the BBC has a higher representation, I would say. Mm -hmm. It's very much connected, and the sun is often there as well. It does, its criticism perhaps is that it focuses on the national press, but the regional and other specialist press, the regional press is so, unfortunately, so shrunken. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very London-centered, which, it, which is a pity, but probably mm -hmm. inevitable. OK, so we're going to open it up. Um, I have to remind you that this is all being filmed and will be on the web. So if you don't want to be filmed, can you not ask a question? Because <laughs> we can't edit you out. So, um, and we have some microphones at the back. So if you just want to raise your hands, and then um, we can come with the microphones. And there is one question at the back there, and then we'll have the man halfway down here. Um. Uh, hi, thank you, Dan, Dan Thisdell. I'm, I'm a journalist myself. You talked about how the media has changed and obviously the shift to, to, to online and the priorities there and also um, more press, uh, re press officers and, and, and very, these changes. Have you seen in recent years uh, any changes, however, in the audience? Um, yes. The biggest change in the audience is that we now hear from them. You didn't know who your audience was um, before the internet, really. You could have a few people took the trouble to write letters, some loony in the famous <laughs> red and green inks and capital letters. You got a little feedback from ordinary, sensible readers. But now there's uh, a much, much greater response from readers, both by emailing me and also um, the FT is one of the papers that still has a sort of full-scale comments section under its online stories. And I do try to um, take the time to read the comments under the stories and, um, if appropriate, to, to answer them. So I think the biggest change is that we know who they are and we're interacting with them. And, and also, I think, as a scientist who gets in the press, if, any, if I ever have a story in the press, I get a huge number of people who will personally track me down and, and email me. And in a way, that, that's actually very rewarding because they're taking the trouble to try and enter some kind of a, a, a debate. Um, yes. Thank you very much for your talk. I, you, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the pressure that's on journalists to write sensationally and how you perceive that to affect um, how balanced stories are. So, for instance, in reporting a scientific discovery, there's a, there's a limit to how unbalanced you can be, but perhaps on more controversial issues where there's an active debate in the academic community, how well or not is that reflected in the, then how journalists report such debates? There's um, 
I think the process of exaggeration starts at the very beginning. You talk about re reporting a new piece of research, a new discovery. That it goes through several stages of exaggeration. <laughs> the researchers often exaggerate it to uh, draw the attention of their university press office, if they're academics. The press office will further exaggerate it to draw the attention of journalists. And then the journalists <laughs> exaggerate it further in the way I described. So I think this amplification of exaggeration, um, I think that's probably increased over the years, but it certainly has. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks. Um, slightly following up on, on what you just said, but also your mention at the start of Daily Mail and Sun journalists' appetite for medical stories in particular. I was wondering on your, uh, your comment on the responsibility of science journalists for stories like the Andrew Wakefield story, for example. Um, yeah, that's... Gosh, I think the, the problem with the Andrew Wakefield story is that science journalists have great respect for top journals, in this case, The Lancet, and also they have great respect for um, top universities or academic institutions. And if someone, Andrew Wakefield, he was at the Royal Free, wasn't he? And his paper was published in The Lancet to their great discredit. And I think that is why it got a lot of traction, because it was saying something controversial. But if he hadn't had those credentials of a peer-reviewed paper in a top medical journal, it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have gone so far. And I think journalists, I mean, it would have been hard to ignore, wouldn't it? You couldn't suppress the news. Okay, so the embargo system is useful because if you get, I, I don't know, I, I can't rem, I wasn't involved in reporting Wakefield. I think I may have been on holiday when, when that paper came out, but it would have been, um, you'd have got it three or four days beforehand, and the embargo system is very strict. If you sign up for the embargoed list of, the, of a journal, um, or Eureka Alert, which is the biggest one, that's the sort of aggregator run by the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, where um, hundreds of universities put embargoed press releases with very strict release times. If you get three or four days, that should enable you to get some opinion. And people say, whoa, watch this carefully. This may not be right. Mm. I, mean, that's, I mean, that's a good um, effect of the embargo system. But I can't remember, and I haven't looked back to see whether the Wakefield paper, before it was published, had a lot of people saying, this can't be true, this is going to be very dangerous if you write about it. But it used well, as I say, the embargo system, I think, can make sure that at least some contrary views are available. Because you are allowed to show embargoed papers to other scientists, as long as they will also sign up for the embargo and to, won't to generally distribute it. But it's quite hard to get, I mean, my experience, to get a scientist who hasn't read a paper to evaluate it properly in the short time available. But I mean, you've raised a very good point, I think. So, um, I wonder if you could comment on science media in the era of social media and the way in which many of us now consume information? Um, I think there's been rather a revival of long-form science and other journalism in the era of social media, because you can 
absorbs so much so quickly on Twitter and Facebook pages and, and elsewhere. But you're not going to um, have a well-argued 800, let alone 3,000 word um, article. So I think it's putting a premium on longer articles in the traditional media. Though as those surveys show, most people still get more science news from traditional news sources than from social media. There's a lady at the back. And then, oh, yeah. hang on. There's to the lady at and then there's the back. Right and then the there back. is the lady yes. in the green. And yeah. then there is somebody in between that. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Yes, I'm Dr. Suzanne Bartleson, Institute of Applied Health Research at Birmingham. And we've worked for several years on the field of air pollution, impacts of air pollution, and have been really surprised in the traction that that's had in the media over probably the, recent, probably the last 12 months. And I just wondered what your thoughts are about the drivers behind these very topical issues, whether that is public appetite or um, political agenda, because in many ways, the, it's not that the science has changed that much in that time, it's just that it's become very, very topical. And we have one new story, there seems to be another and another, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts. It has um, become topical, but I think in the case that you've mentioned, I have, actually, let me step back. One reason for what I'm about to say, which is that I've noticed many more interesting research papers in the field of air pollution, its health effect, maybe because I'm sensitized to see them because it's a topical issue. But for whatever the reason, I have been much more aware of um, studies of air pollution. As I'm talking about local, I mean, we're not talking about um, greenhouse gases here. We're talking about all this um, nasty particulates, NOx, etc. Um, so yes, it, it has taken off. I think it's probably a combination of factors. Clearly the best example of what you've just mentioned is the um, plastics in the ocean, um, which um, was brewing as an issue. And then there were two or three things that came together in this country, obviously, it was Blue Planet 2 and David Attenborough, but there were some other very powerful um, stimulating events. There was an Australian researcher whose name I can't remember who went to the most remote island in the whole world, in the Pacific, uninhabited, and she took some horrifying pictures of this pristine island as it had been 20 or 30 years ago with the beaches covered with, with plastic that had been, because he was unfortunately in the way of various currents. So events like that can come together to produce the effect you've asked about. We, I mean, I think that that's very interesting. We, we've had a really interesting experience over the last week when a, um, a paper came out about low fertility and falling fertility. And I would say at the Institute, myself and the director, have done maybe 10 television, radio, and newspaper reports on it, and at least two, if not three, feature pieces which will be coming out over the next few mm. weeks. And every time we say, actually, the story isn't really about low fertility, it's about differential fertility rates, and particularly that we still have very high fertility in some parts, particularly of sub-Saharan Africa. And the journalists have said, no, but that isn't the interesting story. You know, we want to know about low fertility. And that's probably one of the few times where the journalist has really run the story because they see it as a story that they can sell rather than actually what the real story is, which is quite the opposite. And, and we work really quite hard to push this other story, but it isn't the story they're interested in at the moment. Has that so, worked? Well, at the, no, at the moment we failed. I mean, we, you know, we just keep getting... People keep coming back to us about this low fertility story, which isn't really, to be honest... I don't think that, that important a story or a particularly new story, but it's been picked up by journalists as something that's of interest. Yes. Yeah, so the journalist is running the science story, um, I think. Um, but let's have, we've probably got time for the two more questions at the back. Hello, hi. I'm actually part of the uh, PR team at the Oxford Martin School. Um, <laughs> and my question was just around 
do we communicate enough the process and the rigor that goes into academic research when it can appear on the same page as something like a, an unacademic poll of customers or, you know, an opinion piece? It's so hard to write about the process of academic research and, as you say, the rigor, the sheer hard work, the checking, the various informal as well as formal peer review processes that take, take, take place. I mean, to some extent, what goes on in academia can be brought out by bad things. For example, recently there have been, as you will know, allegations of bullying and harassment in academia and in scientific research. And where those have been written about, that, I think, has shed a light on some of the less savory aspects of the research process, the pressure, the bullying that can go on of professors to PhD students, obviously a small minority, but that's, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking, I may, maybe what I'm saying is wrong, but it, it, it strikes me as that that's a way of shining a light on the way academic research takes place. Sorry, that's probably not the answer you want. <laughs> Uh, to what extent do you see your job as a science journalist as um, holding scientists in some way to account? I think that is probably what I'm least good at doing myself, personally. Um, I think I hold them to account by sort of shining a light on their, um, on their discoveries, assessing them, putting them out to the public, saying, I do try, I mean, I, we were talking about sensationalism, I do try to put things into perspective um, more than a lot of my other colleagues. Um, and if something gets a lot of hype, I will try to hold it to account, hold the researchers to account if they're themselves exaggerating it. Um, so I, th I think I do, yes. The type of um, science that's hardest to hold to account is the um, industrial and commercial research because academics, all the openness I've been talking about really applies to um, university researchers and to a lesser extent those in the public, in the, in the government service. But it's very hard to hold um, researchers in the corporate sector to account because you can so it's so hard to get hold of them. They're they're really muzzled. Okay. Well. 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 Thank you again. Cl Clive is very happy to stay behind if there are other people uh, who wanted to come up. And and I have to say because mainly of my involvement with the Science Media Centre, I know Clive is probably the most respected science editor in the, this country, without any doubt. So it's been fantastic uh, having you here. Um, we're going to move back to the government, and this talk is on Monday. So you've only got the weekend, <laughs> and then you're coming back on Monday. And um, we're going to have Dr. Dr. Patrick Valance, who is the government's chief scientific advisor uh, and head of um, the government office of science. So that's on Monday uh, at five o'clock. But can we again thank Clive for a really fascinating insight thank into you. science? I just say, Patrick Valance is a great communicator and a very good scientist, so come along. <laughs>